A meeting of the most mainstream conservatives in Europe yesterday was broken up by the Belgian police who attempted to shut down the event on the grounds that it might have caused a public disorder. Now, to be clear, the European officials did not contend that the NatCon conservatives themselves would cause the public disorder. No, no. That group included a prime minister, members of parliament, intellectuals, journalists, and a bishop, among others. No, no, no. The European officials feared that the mere presence of the mainstream conservatives would cause leftists to become violent. So the conference had to be shut down. The incident was obviously an outrageous injustice, but there was something hilarious about it because it took place in Brussels. This is the de facto seat of the European Union. This is the heart of NATO. This is arguably the center of the Western Empire, which now is openly hostile to Western values. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. A 16-year-old high school student is being punished for using the term illegal alien. I assume he's being punished for being more literate and uh, having a greater facility with the English language than his teachers. We'll get to that in one second. First, though, got to talk about Birch Gold. Text Knowles to 989898. The cost of living has already increased 17% this year and continues to rise despite interest rate controls. As our national debt continues to skyrocket, you need to be confident in the financial services companies you work with, especially regarding your money and future. Birch Gold is a proven industry leader that you want on your side. They demonstrate how precious metal investments can fortify your lifestyle and retirement, even in turbulent economic times. These days, I bet a lot of people are wishing they had a little bit more gold. Birch Gold understands that navigating financial decisions can be daunting. That is why their expertise, coupled with their customer care process, ensures that your purchase or IRA setup is a breeze. If you're considering converting an existing retirement account into a precious metals IRA, their dedicated in-house IRA department is there to guide you every step of the way, making the process feel as simple as a walk in the park. Birch Gold values your questions and concerns. Their team is always available to provide answers and clarity, whether it's about fees, taxes, on rollovers, or the timing of the process. They are here to ensure you feel heard and informed. Right now, text Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, to 989898 to talk to one of Birch Gold's experts and claim your free info kit on gold. You will learn how to convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold. Best part is, it doesn't cost you a penny out of pocket. Text Knowles to 989898. That is Knowles to 989898. During the show yesterday, I was receiving texts from a friend of mine who was at NatCon. I've spoken at NatCon before. NatCon was put together by Yoram Hazoni, the Israeli philosopher who wrote that excellent book on nationalism, The Case for Nationalism, and a lot of other things. There have been marvelous people who have spoken at NatCon, not just yours truly, you know, uh, top one over there, but also people like J.D. Vance. Senator Cruz, I believe, has spoken there. Lots of really influential intellectuals, writers, as I mentioned, priests, bishops. So a friend of mine who's over there, a priest, texts me, says, Michael, are you following what's going on with NatCon? I said, oh, I'll have to look it up. Hold on here. And then I saw that the, the police were cracking down, shutting down this event. Now, why do I mention all the people that were speaking there? I mentioned them to, to point out, this is not some fringe group of people. This is not bloggers or, or people on some unknown social media platform, you know, trafficking in all sorts of extremist ideas. These are the most mainstream people who could even plausibly be called conservative. We're talking about prime ministers. We're talking about uh, members of the European royal family, okay, people who largely go to like ribbon cuttings at shopping malls. We're talking about journalists. What happened to protection for the fourth estate? We're talking about priests, for goodness sakes. We're talking about bishops, okay? Cardinal Mueller, a very uh, prominent, very important uh, bishop and cardinal from Germany, uh, said it was like the Nazis, according to a report. Said it was like the SA coming in saying, nope, sorry, no, no speaking in here. 
Uh, Nigel Farage, speaking of mainstream figures, he was over there. This obviously was not the American NatCon, which I've been happy to go to. Uh, this was over in Europe, so focused a little bit more on European leaders. And here is the leader of Brexit, the man who got Britain to pull away from the EU, probably feeling better than he's ever felt in his whole life, uh, describing the scene as it went down. That meeting, over the next two days, you've got the Prime Minister of Hungary, you've got a bishop, you've got members of the European royal families coming, uh, well known international businessmen and women, uh, politicians, leaders of parties that will win European elections in countries this year, in June, uh, and yet, because they're questioning ever closer union, because they're questioning globalism, they're literally being shut down. This is like the old Soviet Union. No alternative view allowed. I'll tell you what, I might have had my reservations about the way the Conservative government have carried out Brexit. If anything convinced me we did the right thing, it was what happened in that place this morning. And I'm sure this is going to convince a lot of other people of that. A big miscalculation, I think, by the globalists yesterday at NatCon. You, they're, they're, going to, they're going to try to pretend that uh, the, the national conservatives are Nazis. I think this is a very difficult point to argue when national conservatism is led by an Israeli philosopher. <laughs> That's going to be a really hard argument for them to make. They're going to say it's this fringe extreme group. It's going to be really hard when there are multiple prime ministers and heads of state there. It's going to be really difficult to do. They're, they're going to say that this is some, I don't know, nefarious, immoral gathering. It's going to be very difficult when some of the most admired and important prelates and clergy in the world are there. Uh, total, total joke. And this is really going to be helpful for the Eurosceptic point of view. The people who in Europe are skeptical of the European Union, of all these technocrats in Brussels running their lives for them, the people in, in the United Kingdom who maybe were on the fence about the Brexit. Looking at this, they're going to say, you know, I'm glad that I get to run my own life and these lunatics in Belgium are not running it for me. And it's going to have a ripple effects over here in America because there has been a big movement against liberal globalism in recent years. And uh, I, I think this is just affirmation that this was the, the right call. President Trump probably, as the as leader of the Republican Party, is probably going to lean into his anti-globalist bona fides, and he's going to have every good reason to do that. Speaking of hostility to our values, uh, some Democrats were just asked whether or not they condemned uh, flag burning and death to America chants that have cropped up in the U.S., over the past couple of days. Now, when I say Democrats were asked this, I'm not talking about just random libs on the street. I'm talking about Democrat members of Congress. I'm talking about the squad. Some of the most prominent members, Ayanna Presley, AOC. Here's what they had to say. Anti-Israel protesters blocking the Brooklyn Bridge uh, were burning the American flag and chanting death to America. Do you support that type of protest? Do you support burning the American flag and chanting death to America? Does it sound like this is pro-Palestinian or anti-American if they're burning American flags and chanting death to America? I'm, I'm not privy to, to, I haven't seen these reports. I'd have to check for them myself. Anti-Israel protesters blocking the Brooklyn Bridge burned the American flag and chanted death to America. Do you condemn this type of rhetoric? We've got to get her on to her next event. Here. Are you okay with people burning the American flag? <laughs> You'd like to follow up with us. So. Are you okay with people chanting death to America? Sorry, we've got to head into Congresswoman the Porter, are you okay with people chanting death to America? <laughs> Is it okay? Do you not have a problem with it? Happy to reach out here. The only person I feel bad for is this poor Hill staffer who it opens up with Ayanna Presley, then it moves on to AOC, and then you have this other huge lib, Katie Porter. Democrat member of Congress, and this poor guy who's either her chief of staff or the communications director, he said, uh, um, can you, you, uh, please stop asking her questions. He's sort of, I don't mean to be mean to him, he's sort of like Greg from Succession. You know, uh, what do I do with my hands? Like, I don't, oh man, there's, we have to get her into her next event. Into her next event, what are you talking, you're, you're walking through a gigantic open area. Unless you're going to teleport into the building, you're going to keep walking. You're going to have a chance to answer the question, hey, do you think it's right to burn the American flag? Hey, do you think it might be uh, not the best thing to chant death to America? Oh, we, uh, we don't. Can you please, please email me? Please don't. Why are you? Please put the microphone away. Katie Porter won't answer it. Ayanna Presley won't answer it. Seems like a simple question. I think burning the American flag is bad. I think chanting death to America is bad. 
AOC, who's a smarter politician than those two, decided to play dumb. So I hadn't, I hadn't heard about that. I'm going to have to look into that. Okay, well, what about in principle? Do you think it's bad to burn the flag? Do you think it's bad to chant death to America? But they can't condemn it. None of these leftist Democrats can condemn it. Why? Because they would be alienating their base. That's it. For the AOCs, I'm not saying for the Chuck Schumers of the world. I'm not saying for the Joe Manchins of the world. I'm not saying, it's crazy that I even would consider Chuck Schumer to be a slightly more moderate Democrat. But compared to AOC, he certainly is. Compared to Ayanna Presley, he certainly is. He doesn't want to abolish all the prisons. For these guys, the squad, their base is the pro-Palestine, purple-haired, you know, death to America, burn the American flag kind of base. Now, the way the libs are going to try to spin this is say, well, you, you know, you're just coming out against the pro-Palestine protesters. No, I don't. If someone wants to protest for a new state for Palestine, uh, okay, fine, whatever. People protest for all sorts of things. If someone wanted to come out and protest against the state of Israel, that's fine. You can protest against the state of Israel. If someone wanted to burn the Palestinian flag or the Israeli flag, I might have personal views on the prudence of that, but I, I don't doesn't really bother me. You can go burn your own property if you want, I guess. But the American flag, the symbol of our country, uh, that's quite another thing. I don't really understand the justification for burning the American flag. If you want to chant death to Palestinian statehood or death to Israel or death to, I don't know, death to Azerbaijan or death to Tibet, I don't, I'm going to have some personal opinions over the wisdom of that, but very different thing than being an American in America, chanting death to America, and the American politician can't condemn that? Excuse me? Well, why is that? It's because what Republicans accuse the Democrats of for decades and decades is now manifestly true, which is that the party hates America. <laughs> they don't like America. They think it's a bad country. They think it was unjustly founded. They think its history is marred by evil and injustice. They think that America should be weaker today, that that would be better for the whole wide world. And the real reason these guys don't want to answer the question is probably deep down, if they had their druthers, they'd be out burning the flag with them. Deep, deep down. They, they burn the flag in a different way. They burn the flag rhetorically. They burn the flag from their lecterns at the U.S. Congress. But the principle is basically the same. Very difficult to see uh, a, a strong burning order of patriotism in these sorts of people who blanch at the, mere, at the mere prospect of even meekly condemning the chant, death to America. Now, when you want to sleep soundly, even in these crazy times, you ought to check out Cozy Earth. Go to CozyEarth.com slash Knowles. As Mother's Day approaches, there is no better time to celebrate the special woman in your life who has nurtured, cared for, and loved you unconditionally. This Mother's Day, consider giving her the gift of Cozy Earth, a luxurious sleep experience she truly deserves. Cozy Earth's sheets redefine luxury and comfort. Crafted from viscose bamboo, am I pronouncing that correctly? They are temperature regulating, ensuring a restful night's sleep for both hot and cold sleepers. I absolutely adore Cozy Earth, especially on my big California King. It, it, the bamboo sheets are terrific. Cozy Earth caters to your unique style and preferences with a wide range of sizes and 11 vibrant colors. You don't even need to take my word for it because you might say, Michael, I don't know if I trust your taste, but sweet little Elisa, who is a very discerning woman, she loves Cozy Earth as well. This Mother's Day, treat a special woman in your life to the luxury she deserves with Cozy Earth bedding and sleepwear. She deserves it. Don't forget to use promo code Knowles, Canada BLAS, at checkout for 35% off all Cozy Earth products. CozyEarth.com. After placing your order, select podcast in the survey, then select my show in the drop down menu that follows, and then, I don't know, write me a love letter to CozyEarth.com, promo code Knowles. Speaking of our democracy, our sacred democracy, Arizona is requiring an ID to go vote. This is really great news, but it reveals some really bad news. So Secretary of State of Arizona has this on the website. Important information re regarding proof of citizenship. A person is not required to submit proof of citizenship with the voter registration form, but failure to do so means the person will only be eligible to vote in federal elections. Wait, what? 
Hold on, it goes on. Maybe there's more context. Uh, You'll be known as being a federal-only voter. A federal-only voter will become eligible to vote a full ballot in all federal, state, county, and local elections if he or she later provides valid proof of citizenship to the appropriate county recorder's office. Okay, so you have a voter registration form. You can fill out the voter registration form. You can successfully register to vote without an ID, but only in the federal elections. So if you're voting for, you know, county commissioner of Palookaville, if, if you're voting for dog catcher in Maricopa County, you, you need an ID. Your vote will not be counted if you cannot prove that you are who you say you are and that you are an eligible voter. But if you want to vote for president of the United States, oh, you don't need an ID. Who cares? You want to vote for a United States Senate? or Congress even, oh, you don't need an ID. That's fine. Excuse me? Don't. Isn't the vote for president a little bit more important than the vote for dog catcher? So why is there a more stringent voter re- pre- ID requirement for the latter than for the former? Why is that? Why is Arizona implementing these voter ID measures at all? I thought there was no such thing as voter fraud. I thought that the Democrats never tried to steal elections. I thought this is not a problem. This is a made up problem by the boogeyman Republicans. So hold on. What's the advantage here? Is it that Democrats obviously know that it is, that there is such a thing as voter fraud? There is such a thing as voter registration fraud and they want to make sure they lock down their voters in their state. But maybe, you know, at the federal level, not so big a deal. What, what is that? Why, why is there one rule for the local and not for the federal? What do Democrats have planned for the federal election? I shudder to think. Speaking of the election, Katie Couric, the longtime host of the Today Show on NBC, just sat down with Bill Maher. Katie Couric has a theory on what motivates the Trump voters. We've always heard it's the, it's the racism, it's the hatred, they're evil, they're insurrectionists, they're this, they're that. But one charge that we have not heard in a little while is that they're big, dumb, fat idiots. According to Katie Couric, one of the main drivers between, behind the Trump movement is anti-intellectualism. When I'm talking about overall income inequality and even taking race out of it, the huge chasm between the uber, uber, uber wealthy and yes. people who don't have $400 in an emergency. Ridiculous. It is, it has never been such a stark divide. Right. And I feel like, to your point, Bill, the socioeconomic disparities are a lot, and class resentment is a lot what, and anti-intellectualism and elitism is what is driving many of these these anti-establishment, which are Trump voters, right. are anti-establishment Absolutely. voters. So I think that is a huge problem that we have to address. I mean, globalization and, you know, the transition from an industrial to a technological so, society. I mean, I, I, and I don't know if you've ever been jealous of some what someone else has or resentful. It is such a corroding and um, bitter, almost bile (laughs) feeling. And I think that when people who are really struggling see people who have everything and are on top of that looking down on them, it is just a recipe for such anger and resentment and grievance. That's, that's it. Those Trump voters, they're just so envious. You know, they're just, they're so greedy. They're jealous. They're petty. Let's, let's take that charge first. There have always been socialists. Well, in recent decades, there, there have been socialists in the Democratic Party, but they usually kept quiet about it. Now they're a little more open about it. They will be card carrying members of the Democratic Socialists of America. And, and the Democrats now want to lecture us about envy. There are calls among prominent Democrats. There are initiatives underway by Democrat politicians to take money from white people and give it to black people as reparations for slavery because people are demanding money for something their great, 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 great grandfathers probably didn't even do in, in the case of uh, like recent black immigrants, but, but may have done 400 years ago. 
But you want to lecture us about envy? You want to lecture us about avarice? You want to lecture us about resentment for what other people have? We're, we, are, we are hearing from prominent Democrat politicians that America is stolen land, that we stole it from the indigenous and we need to give it back. But you want to lecture us about, give me a break. I, I think uh, this is a little bit of projection. The envy. When you talk to the average Republican conservative voter, what do they say? Leave me alone. Stop taking my money. Please stop messing up my life. I just kind of want to have my job and do my thing and have my family. And you guys just keep coming in and taking more of my money and taking more of my rights away and, taking, and, and messing up my way of life. Give me a break. But, but then to the charge of anti-intellectualism. This is the part that Katie Couric said that I think is fair. I do think there is a strain of anti-intellectualism, not anti-intelligence, not anti-truth, not anti-education even, anti-intellectualism on the right. Why is that? Because our intellectuals don't know the difference between a boy and a girl anymore. That's why. That's why we're a little skeptical of the intellectuals, because the intellectuals for decades, but especially in recent years, have demonstrated themselves to be complete idiots who don't know anything about anything, <laughs> who don't know the difference. They don't know what a woman is. That's what that's, remember that Matt's whole movie? That's what that's about. These are people who don't know what a border is. These are people who don't know what a baby is. The intellectuals are big dummies. If the intellectuals in our society, the, the leading public intellectuals, it, the, if they were really smart and really effective and efficient, we wouldn't be so skeptical of them. Our problem with the intellectuals right now is that they don't appear to be very intelligent. They certainly don't appear to be educated. There are some intellectuals who are not quite as prominent because they're not members of the liberal establishment. There are plenty of conservative intellectuals. There, there are way more serious think tanks on the right than there are on the left. There are, there are uh, way more uh, serious meetings and conventions. There's much more engagement with real intellectual history, real threads of philosophy on the right than there is on the left right now. And what does the left do when that happens? They try to shut it down. When a conservative tries to give a speech on a college campus, what do they do? I've, I've been at the center of this a number of times. They try to shut it down. When a, when a group of mainstream conservatives, including many intellectuals, all organized by a philosopher, decide to hold a conference in Europe, what happens? The libs try to shut it down. That's our problem with the intellectual. That's what's leading to the intellectual, anti-intellectual uh, sentiment right now on the right. Uh, Katie Kirk says there's an anti-elite sentiment. Right, because our elites are incompetent and they're stupid and they're leading us off a cliff. That's why we, it's not that we hate elites in general. It's not that we hate intellect, far from it. We just want our elites to care for the common good, to have proper function of their intellect, and to do things that are smart and good, not stupid and evil, which is what we're getting. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've all been waiting for is finally here. The legendary, the iconic, the one and only Leftist Tears Tumblr has made its triumphant return. It is the talk of the ten. Everybody's talking about it, folks. The desire of the masses. There's a catch. The only way to get your hands on it is by becoming a new Daily Wire Plus annual member. Your annual membership does not just get you this coveted Tumblr. It opens the doors to a world of unparalleled access to ad-free, uncensored shows from your favorite Daily Wire hosts, like yours truly. Plus, on-demand hit movies, series, and groundbreaking documentaries. And yes, that membership now includes our Leftist Tears Tumblr. So let the soccer moms clutch their Stanleys. And the techies brag about their Bluetooth smart mugs. Is that a thing? Do those exist? You will be making a statement and taking a stand as you proudly sip from your iconic Leftist Tears Tumblr. New Insider Annual members get a free Tumblr. But why stop at one? You can really put your money where your values are with an all-access membership. And we will send you not one, not one and a half, no, no, two Leftist Tears Tumblrs for free. All you have to do is join and give us your money for the membership. And then you get them for free. Join us now as we fight the left and build the future. DailyWirePlus.com. Speaking of education, there's a white student. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a group of white students at a high school in New Jersey who have formed a white student union. And this is causing lots of consternation among the administration. 
Collingswood School District officials and police are investigating incidents of racial bias, including the creation of a so-called white student union at Collingswood High School. Action News Race and Culture reporter Toronto Thomas is live at Collingswood High School with more. And Toronto students say kids in that club often racially harass other students. That's what they say, and high school administrators also informed the district that the students allegedly engaged in unacceptable actions. It was part of an unsanctioned club that students say called itself the White Student Union. It's been crazy in school, like, since probably like last year. But ninth grader Kimani Washington says racial incidents at Collingswood High School reached a new level recently when several students created what they call the White Student Union. I saw like a lot of different things in school. Like it was like racial slurs. Members of the White Student Union calling others the N-word. That's just one of the allegations now at the center of the investigation. The Camden County Prosecutor's Office confirms both they and the police department are in the midst of an active and ongoing investigation into the alleged racial incidents. Okay, so a handful of students form a fake club. It's unsanctioned, it's not an official club, called the White Student Union and everything melts down. The entire community goes into chaos. The, the local news are reporting on this. They're interviewing people. The administration's clamping down. The police are invest. The police are investigating? Why? Because according to reports, we have no idea of, uh, if, if this is true or not, the white students harassed non-white students. Okay. And if that's true, that's obviously very bad. To me, the more interesting news story, well, it's not a news story, it's never covered because it's just taken as a matter of course, is that this happens every day in the other direction with far more powerful people doing the harassing. The story to me is not three white students reportedly harass non-white students. The story to me is faculty and media and the governing powers regularly harass white students because this was a non-sanctioned white student union. But there are very much sanctioned black student unions at most schools around the country. Every university, at least, has a black student union. I wouldn't be surprised if many high schools have them now, too. And an Asian student group, and a this student group, and a that student group. What is shocking to me here is not that these kids seem to be just like playing a joke. And, and maybe they did harass students and that would be bad. And maybe they did say nasty language and that would be bad. But this is all just a little joke. This is all just a little sideshow that has absolutely no institutional support. What about the AFAM organizations, the, the black student unions at every school that regularly promote absolute bile against white students that say that whiteness is evil, that whiteness needs to be abolished, that it's a call for genocide against white people, that, that regularly stoke resentment and envy that say that white people need to pay black people for some historic sin, real or imagined? What about that? Where's the news story for that? Where's the police investigation of that? I don't hear it anywhere. So what are the students doing? If I didn't know any better, I would view this little stunt as, well, either kids being just sort of uh, edgy and even somewhat idiotic as kids want to be. But at a basic level, I'd probably view this stunt as a natural reaction to the racial animus that is constantly thrown in their direction from every single power center. And it, it raises an important question, raises an important question over the kind of language that we, we ought to use in public life, cutting in all sorts of directions. What kind of language is, uh, obviously we don't, no one wants to uh, normalize the N word in public life, but you know what else? I think we should also probably kick out of public life, all this abolish whiteness stuff. I think that's kind of nasty. I think all of these attacks and insults against white people and against men and against Christians, I think they're pretty nasty too, and I think they ought to be discouraged. Maybe, maybe that question comes up. And maybe a question over the, the black student union. I had a friend in college, freshman year, nice, normal guy. Totally kind of suburban, just normal guy, black guy. And then he got involved with the black student union or whatever the group was called in college. 
And I tell you, man, by the end of college, this guy was Malcolm X. He wasn't really Malcolm X, but he was talking like Malcolm X. He had been indoctrinated into this very resentful kind of worldview. He didn't start out that way. He was, he was indoctrinated into it. It reminded me of the uh, New York radical feminists of the 1970s, where they would hold these meetings and they would take perfectly happy housewives and then they'd convince them that they're all miserable and then the housewives would leave and they'd be just angry, screeching, shrewish women. <laughs> and uh, that, that's what these groups exist to do. So, okay, how come we can have a black student union and an Asian student union and a Hispanic student union, but you can't have a white student union? Why is that? Isn't that a little strange? I probably wouldn't join any of the student unions. Probably wouldn't join a union. But isn't that a little strange? That seems unstable to me. That seems unsustainable. And it is unsustainable. And, and as long as you keep pushing this stuff against white people, you're going to get more of these little reactions, these very modest little reactions. And the town's going to melt down over it. Okay, why? Why is the town melting down? What does that tell you about your own double standards? Now, speaking of high school students, there is... A 16-year-old high school student in North Carolina, we have to thank our friends over at Lives of TikTok for this story, a 16-year-old high school student who is being punished for using the phrase illegal alien. His name is Christian. If you're watching the show rather than listening to it, you can see a picture of him. Looks like a nice kid, clean-cut kid. His hair's a little bit long, but it's okay. He's a teenage boy. Uh, He was suspended for three days after using the term illegal alien in an English assignment because the term is supposedly offensive and disrespectful. Now his record could be damaged. This could mess up his GPA. This could mess up up his academic record. Who knows? This might affect where he goes to college. Why? Because he used a term that is precise. This is the term that until very, very recently was used by our federal government. It's a term that is quite clinical, actually. Illegal, means uh, not legal. Alien means foreigner. So illegal alien refers to people who are foreigners, who are citizens or subjects of a foreign state who come into our country illegally. What, what term would you like me to use other than illegal alien? What term is that kid supposed to use? The, probably what the libs want him to use is a term like uh, undocumented American. But he's not an American. He's a foreigner. And I'm sure he's got some, he's got documents in his own country. He just doesn't have any documents here. We want you to use the phrase dreamer. Dreamer. I'm a dreamer, man. I have dreams almost every night. But we're not talking about me, right? We're not, we're talking about a kind of a different thing here. Well, we want you to use the phrase future, future citizen, future Democrat voter is actually what they want to use. Well, we are just some euphemism, right? Euphemism. So the kid, for his English assignment, is using clear, descriptive language rather than mealy-mouthed, prevaricating euphemisms. And the kid is being punished for that. The kid is being punished by his English teacher for writing well. That's where we're at in American education. Great essay, highly recommended if you're a teenage English student or, well, really, if you're of any age called Politics in the English Language by George Orwell, in which Orwell describes how to write clearly and to write well. We want to use simple words. We want to use evocative words, not mealy-mouthed words. Good old Anglo-Saxon words, you know, not these kind of squishy Latinate words. And we want to say what we mean and we want to mean what we say. And we want uh, an economy of language and we want to be concise and we want to be clear. That's what that kid did. And he's being punished for it. Our schools go in and in sex ed, you're taught that boys are girls and girls are boys. That's that's not sex education, that's sex maleducation. You go in and you learn that America is an evil, rotten, terrible country that was founded to promote genocide that was founded in 1619. That's not history, that's anti-history. You go in, you learn common core math, (laughs) which is usually not math, it's kind of an anti-math. You go in and you learn that there's no such thing as truth and we can never know anything about truth. That's not philosophy. That's anti-philosophy. And now you go into your English class, you write well, and you get points taken off. And maybe you get a mark on your record. You get suspended from school. That's not 
English language, that's not writing. That's anti-writing. That's anti-rhetoric. That's anti-oratory. That's, that's going to make you dumb. That's maleducation. And the kid is being punished for trying to, to learn and to write and to speak well. I hope the kid gets off the hook. Obviously, I, if there's any way to, I don't know how to support him other than calling some attention to the story after Libs of TikTok did the same thing. Big problem. You got to pay attention to where your kid's in school. Because even if he squeaks by in this sort of thing, he's obviously at a terrible school. Whatever school district this is, the CD8 High School Spartans. I don't even know what CD stands for. That's obviously a terrible high school. And the teachers who, who push this kind of stuff should be fired. Not, not just because uh, they've transgressed some p- political line, but because they don't do their jobs well. Because this English teacher is teaching students to write poorly. That's really bad. And education is going to stick with you. And if your kid is raised to have his head filled with a bunch of nonsense and to not even know how to use the English language, well, you, not only ha- has he missed an opportunity, but you've, you've actually set him up to fail in life. I feel bad for this kid. I feel really bad for all the other students at this high school who are obviously being failed in their education. Now, speaking of misuse of the English language and filling people's heads with lies, NPR, National Public Radio, has a new CEO. And the new CEO is a huge lib. This is, thanks to Chris Rufo, the, I I won't even say conservative intellectual. I won't even say, though he is that. I won't even say conservative journalist, though he is that. Chris Rufo is a Gramscian political operative for the right. Chris Rufo is Saul Alinsky for the right. Chris Rufo is a student of Herbert Marcuse for the right. He is a radical political operative who keeps scoring wins. He got Claudine Gay, the president of Harvard, fired. He's racked up a number of other wins in his career. And now he is absolutely destroying the new CEO of NPR with her own words. We'll get to that in one second. First, though, subscribe to the Michael Knowles Show YouTube channel. Smash that subscribe button. Ring that bell. Ding that dong. Do whatever you got to do. Make sure you get the updates for new videos. My favorite comment yesterday is from Aaron Gum, who says the summarized in X minutes titles will never get old. Yeah, what are we going to do today, Mr. Davies? 16-year-old kid's plight summarized in 10 seconds. That's what the show is going about. I don't even, who knows? I forget. Halfway through this show. I don't know. There's so much going on. But what, what this part of the show is about is the new CEO of NPR. NPR, National Public Radio, receives some public funding, doesn't it? Should probably be held to a higher standard than the usual partisan media. And so did they hire an objective, serious newsman to take this job? No, they hired this lady. What about the hard things, the places where we are prone to disagreement, say politics and religion? Well, as it turns out, not only does Wikipedia's model work there, it actually works really well. Because in our normal lives, these contentious conversations tend to erupt over disagreement about what the truth actually is. But the people who write these articles, they're not focused on the truth. They're focused on something else, which is the best of what we can know right now. And after seven years of working with these brilliant folks, I've come to believe that they are onto something, that perhaps for our most tricky disagreements, seeking the truth and seeking to convince others of the truth might not be the right place to start. In fact, our reverence for the truth might be a distraction that's getting in the way of finding common ground and getting things done. (laughs) The new head of NPR, the, the face of American public journalism says that the truth is getting in the way of getting things done. We need, you know, this truth thing is a real hassle for us journalists. So we gotta, we gotta move past the truth. So what would you call a journalistic endeavor that ignores the truth? I guess you, I guess you would call that fake news. I don't know if Trump is a wizard. I don't know if he got his powers from Dumbledore or Gandalf or wherever. But Trump has this uncanny ability to make his opponents become the caricature of themselves that he, port- that he paints. 
And that's what's happened here. The new head of NPR is bragging at a TED Talk about how we need more fake news. And she is now the head of fake news NPR. It's so delicious. Chris Rufo has, has pulled up zillions of this woman's old tweets. Uh, during, during BLM, not during the latest BLM, not during you know, the summer of hate when they burned the country down a few years ago. This is all the way back 10 years ago in 2014, the first time this popped up. The new head of NPR says, protest on Market Street. Muni stopped in both directions. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Back at, she was an early adopter of BLM before they started torching everything. Now, the New York Times is even reporting. Headline, NPR CEO faces criticism over tweets supporting progressive causes. All sorts of things. You know, even in the subheader right here, uh, apparently this woman, Catherine Marr, claimed that Donald Trump is a racist. All the rest of it. What I love about this is conservatives made this headline happen. Chris Rufo specifically made the New York Times report on this by just digging up this woman's old tweets. But the key here, and Rufo has bragged about this, is that he's put NPR in a lose-lose situation. What can NPR do now? NPR can either fume, grit its teeth, and then stick by the new CEO, in which case it loses major credibility. I, I know conservatives who would listen to NPR. NPR used to be the thing that just kind of educated people would have on in the background. No longer. If NPR sticks with the CEO, they are admitting we are a far leftist joke, fake news organization. Now, maybe they'll do that just to avoid giving Rufo and the conservatives the win. But what's the alternative? The only alternative is they fire the CEO because she's obviously not fit for this job. And if they fire the CEO, Rufo claims another scalp. Those are the two options. What's the good option for NPR here? There is none. This is exactly the kind of position that you want to put your opponent in, where any move they make is a loss. Now, speaking of women in jobs, that's a little bit of a weak segue, but speaking of blonde women in jobs where, where people are criticizing them for what they've said, uh, Kirsten Dunst has just, you remember Kirsten Dunst? She was an actress. She was in Spider-Man. She's just gone on the record in an interview to complain. I guess this pulls everything full circle on, on the, the gospel of envy that keeps cropping up. Katie Couric's accusing the right of that. Really, it seems to be a little more prominent on the left and all of the grievance. And well, here's a grievance from a very famous, very wealthy Hollywood actress, Kirsten Dunst, who's upset that in the movie Spider-Man, she didn't make as much money as her co-star. Hopefully, the way I carve my path will help other, you know, actresses. And But I definitely grew up in a time with major pay disparity between um, the lead actor and myself, even though I had been in Bring It On and he hadn't. You know what I mean? Well, I had more done. success in my box office than he did. And I was 17. I'm still learning. You know, when you're that age, I'm still learning my taste in film. I didn't even think to ask. I didn't even know what there was a place to challenge it. That's how it felt at 17. Oh, it's so awful. This poor 17-year-old, extremely wealthy Hollywood starlet was taken advantage of by giving the lead in a, a very, very popular movie, or one of the leads in a very, very popular movie. Crucially, not the lead, I guess, because I'm looking here. Let me just take a look at the cast list. Um, Tobey Maguire, who apparently made more money than her on this movie, he played... Uh, Spider-Man in the movie Spider-Man. And Kirsten Dunst played Spider-Man's girlfriend. So it, they didn't have exactly the same job. This isn't, you know, a disparate pay for the same work. Tobey Maguire was the title character. She says, yeah, but I was more famous than he was going into it. I don't know, maybe you were, but, you know, so what? You, that, 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 that's true in a lot of Movies. You get a more established actor is in a supporting role, and the newcomer is is in a major. But he's Spider Man. Of course, he's Spider Man's going to make more money than Spider Man's girlfriend in the movie Spider Man. That's just how it works. And, and it brings up a broader point about work and all this grievance mongering and all this all this activism, which comes down to a, a leveling kind of uh, egalitarian leftism. Uh, you know, it, the, the, this is when the the modern liberals really start to sound like actual communists when they just want everybody to be given the exact same thing for, 
regardless of the distinctions in their life or the functions they perform. When we hear talk of the wage gap, whether it's in an office or whether it's in Hollywood, we're told that people are paid more or less money for the same work. No two people have the same job. No two people perform the same work. No two people are the same. We're all a little bit different. We all do things a little bit differently. Some people perform their work a little faster, some people a little less fast. Some negotiate a little harder, some negotiate a little less hard. Some show up a little early, some show up a little bit later. Some, we have different roles in our companies. We have different roles in movies. We're all, we're all a little bit different. No two people are alike. And, and beneath this, this leftist demand for, you know, equal pay for actually unequal work or whatever is a, a leftist premise that we're all really the same. We're all kind of interchangeable. We're all just cogs in a machine. No, Spider-Man and Spider-Man's girlfriend are not interchangeable in the movie Spider-Man. Okay. They're complimentary. They, they, they nice, they go together. They make a nice story, but they're not. No two people at, at, at a company, at a factory, in the field, in anywhere are totally interchangeable. We're unique. We all have different strengths. And when you want to level and make everything just homogenous and bland and boring, that is not uh, merely an attack on conservatives. It's not merely an attack on this group or that group. It's an attack on humanity where we are all distinct. We all have something that we can contribute. And the left wants to erase all of those beautiful distinctions that really do add the, the spice of life that we once called variety. Now we call diversity, but they don't really want any such thing. There is no member block today because I am in Illinois because I was speaking last night at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign where I was doling out champagne for my real friends and real pain for my sham friends. You can catch that speech. If you want to watch something in lieu of the member block, you can watch that speech. It's on YouTube right now. Just, you know, obviously just went up fairly recently, but I need to flee this state because otherwise I'm going to get the Illinois ickies. You know, I'm going to, the lib stuff, I know there's a lot of good conservatives in the middle, but the, I'm in a very liberal part of Illinois. I got to get to Chicago and I don't want, I don't want them to get me. Okay. So I got to flee. We will have member block again tomorrow, the member room segmentum. In the meantime, I'm Michael Knowles. This is the Michael Knowles Show. See you then.